Every once in a while, I like to go and kind of recap things. And one of the things that has been incredibly popular is my tips. They're in my newsletter every week. So we're going to review a few of those top tips right now. I love that uh, intro music. Hopefully you do too. Well, I have been really diligent in my newsletters every week, and this is thanks to my wife. She's been kicking me in the pants for a while to do this, as well as you guys, because each and every one of us has questions about what we should do, how we should do them. I have questions. I go online, try and figure it out, right? We go and we look at Google or maybe we duck that go. There's lots of ways to do it. Nowadays, maybe you're going to uh, an AI of some sort over at Bing or maybe ChatGPT to try and get answers. Well, I have been putting together now for a few months a tip every week. And one week we talked about Patch Aware, which is a, a new service that we're going to be offering that uh, goes through, okay, here's what you need to patch, when you need to patch it, how you can patch it, right? I mean, what you need to patch based on some machine learning, AI, and people skills, looking at all of the patches, which ones you need to mess with. I have the top antivirus and anti-malware solutions for total PC protection. We're going to talk about that next. A step-by-step -step guide to clearing your browser history and wiping away your online footprint. Ransomware, the shocking truth about cyber criminals holding your data hostage. Protect your data like a pro. The 32110 backup method. How to Fort Knox your files on Windows, a step-by-step -step guide. So those are some examples of some that were in my newsletter. And if you don't get the newsletter, make sure you take a couple of minutes here. That's all it'll take and sign up for. Because this is the free newsletter. You don't have to pay a dime. There's no big obligation. What I'm trying to do is get the information out there, get it to you, get it to your friends, let you share it with people. And once you've got all that information, you are going to be ever so much safer. Let me let me tell you, I, I'm absolutely convinced of that. And we keep hearing that from people. So that's a very good thing. And what I've been doing is putting these tips that I write, I put them all together from scratch, putting them up on my website at craigpeterson.com. So you can go there, you can get some of this information pretty easily now. And I do put it into my newsletter as well. So let's start with the first one that was in the recent newsletter. And this is the top antivirus and anti-malware solutions for your PCs. You know, the internet is a very scary place. It has some serious problems. Microsoft has been trying to deal with them for a very long time. And, I, you know, I'm a little opinionated here. And frankly, Microsoft has never been a particularly good computer programming company. And the worst part about Microsoft is how they started. And they started with a hack. It was based on MS-DOS, which of course Bill Gates bought from another company and sold to IBM, and that became PC-DOS. And they grew from there, right? They wanted a windowing interface. You might have noticed that Windows kind of follows the lead from Apple again and again and again. But they followed that lead and they put together their little Windows and Windows for work groups. You might remember Windows uh, 3.11 was kind of a big one for quite a while. And Windows 3.11 gave you that that little point and click interface, but it was still really DOS. It booted DOS and then put the little window interface on top of it. And because it was so 
poorly written, and because the machines at the time were so slow, they ended up uh, having applications that went around the operating system entirely and depended on that. So because Microsoft did not do what they should have done, what Apple had done, they gave people that were writing software... <coughs> They gave people who were writing software the opportunity to write things in a very inefficient or maybe more efficient, ineffective, less secure. There's a lot of ways to describe it, ways. So that's how Microsoft came about. And I worked on Windows for quite a while. One of the things, one of the projects I was on for a year or so was when Microsoft decided they needed to completely rewrite everything because it was such a mess. And that was Windows NT, the NT 1.0 days. And, of course, that went along. And Dave Cutler, the design, you know, there's all kinds of history that we could talk about. But they came out with something that was better. But they still had so many programs that they had to run that were doing some bad things that, my gosh, uh, it, it just propagated all kinds of bad programming. Anyways, going into a lot of detail here. Some people are going to like it, but oh, hopefully you you appreciate the background, right? That's why you listen. Now, a days, Windows has been really the subject of a lot of attacks, of viruses, malware, of all kinds of things, and has pulled up its socks. One of the best tools you can use for antivirus and anti-malware is free in the Windows world. And it's called Windows Defender. Now, it's had its problems, and it has its pros as well, free being one of them. But I've seen some really great statistics, and I talk about this in my article on my website here. But um, Windows Defender really is an excellent choice for protecting your computer. If you're a home user, if you don't have a lot of things that you're worried about, it can really uh, do a great job in protecting you. And I've seen some of the numbers, the statistics that have been put out, where they've analyzed some of the major software on the market that's designed, or supposed to anyways, help protect you from the bad guys and that includes things like the norton antivirus right mcafee the whole semantic thing and when you look at the final numbers windows defender that comes free with windows you got to make sure it's turned on is something that is as effective or even in some cases more effective than all of those that I mentioned to you. So let's go through a few that I like. For my clients, I use some Cisco anti-malware. It's absolutely phenomenal, but it costs real money. And if you're not a client of mine, you are going to have a hard time getting it because you buy these things in license packs and some of these license packs or some of the software can be a thousand licenses. So it gets really, really expensive for the little guy. So let's go through the things that aren't expensive. We mentioned free already. It comes with Windows. Next up, Bitdefender. They've got some excellent protection against malware, viruses, and other cyber threats. It's very simple. It has a firewall. Now, you might say, Craig, wait a minute, Windows, doesn't it have a firewall? Yes, it does. And the Windows firewall's biggest problem is that it has pretty much everything turned on and open. If you have a service running on your Windows computer, whether you know it or not, maybe a file sharing service or maybe a website, that service is open directly to the Internet. And it's not really smart about what it's doing. It's a very basic firewall. It doesn't open up all of the packets and try and reassemble them and figure out what's going on, okay? So Bitdefender has a lot of great tools, anti-phishing protection, webcam protection, and as I mentioned, the firewall all built in. I like it. That's the number one thing I would get if you want to pay for something that gives you a little more of an edge. Number two 
is Malwarebytes. Now, Malwarebytes is primarily a scanner that looks for malicious software, including some rogue security software, adware, spyware, all of which is annoying and can be used to trick you into doing something that you really shouldn't do, like, you know, click on a link that might be bad. Cisco AMP for endpoints is very good, but that costs a few bucks. Cisco Umbrella, excellent, excellent software. But here's the trick with Cisco Umbrella. It has a free version. Check it out online. Cisco um, Umbrella can be purchased for free or for low cost for family by going to opendns.com opendns.com check it out all right make sure you get my newsletter every week including all of these tips craigpeterson.com slash subscribe there's a couple more i want to get to right now before we disappear for uh, for a break, but uh, I mentioned Umbrella, I mentioned Cisco AMP for endpoints, Malwarebytes, Bitdefender, WebRoot antivirus is one that a lot of people I know like. This is kind of a cloud-centric antivirus, anti-malware. It has phishing protection, firewall, ransomware protection, and WebRoot has three consumer versions as well. They've got the basic antivirus package and Security Plus. F-Secure can help as well. And G-Data antivirus. But uh, I think now you know. You can get some of the best protection available for free on your Windows computer by just turning on the Defender. Windows Defender. We're going through some of my tips from recent newsletters and helping you understand a little bit more about your computers and security. Up next, clearing your browser history. We've talked about the top antivirus. You can find that article on my website at craigpeterson.com and anti-malware solutions for total PC protection here, really understanding what you need to do. Let's move on to the next topic here that was in, again, a recent newsletter. And this is more specifically about online privacy. It's probably the number one question I get, which is how can I be safe online? How can I gain a little bit of privacy? And there's a few ways you can do that. I've had a couple articles, and we've talked before about using a privacy-focused search engine, right? Which means not Google. Uh, there are some out there that you can use, and I've recommended them before. But one of the things you can do is clear your browser history in order to wipe away your online footprint. There are some tools you can use, and I've thought about this for a long time. Uh, you know, what can I release? What should I release? And, you know, part of the problem really is that it can be complicated. And I haven't figured out a way to make it really uncomplicated yet. I guess once I do, I'll, you'll be the first to know. But there are some settings that you can do and you can take. And again, you'll find them on my website. But you need to clear your browser's footprint. Here's the reasons I give the top five for doing this. Number one is privacy. Clearing your browser history, your cache, and your cookies can help to protect your online and protect your privacy because it removes traces of your browsing activity and personal information. There are ways for websites to save information on your computer using these cookies and another method. So by doing this, you can really help to prevent unauthorized access to some of that data and guard against tracking 
and profiling. Now, profiling is a new technique that's being used, and it's being used because people don't want cookies. So it tries to build a profile of you and uses that to sell your information to people out there that want to get their hands on it. So profiling is something you want to avoid. The next reason you want to clear your browser's history is security. Because there are things like session hijacking that are being used more and more nowadays. Now, session hijacking is, let's say you've logged into your bank's, bank's computer via your web browser. And your bank has set up a session cookie. They do this all of the time. There's nothing nefarious about it. They need a cookie to know who you are as you go through their website. Well, sometimes there's some bugs in the software of the bank or the site that you're at. And that cookie is used for your session tracking or in some cases, in, in fact, most of them where there's session hijacking, there's private information that is encoded in the URL. So if you look at your URL at the top of the page, you'll see it isn't just, you know, mybank.com. It's mybank.com slash and this big long hexadecimal looking number. That number is generically known as a UUID, universally unique ID. And that can be used for your session. Well, a bad guy could potentially use that information, and they have, in order to take over your session with the bank or someone else. So removing these temporary files can really help with the session hijacking. It can help with what are called cross-site scripting attacks. These are pretty common out there too. You don't want those. So removing these temporary files as cached data can really help up a lot. It frees up storage space on your computer, but when you actually look at the size of some of these files that are stored, it's, uh, it's hardly worth mentioning. You're going to be removing temporary files that can slow down your browser, cause other issues, and it'll help you prevent unauthorized access. So let's get into exactly how you do this. You'll find it again on my website, craigpeterson.com. Just search for clearing browser history or browser history on my site. So here's what you can do, and I've got some pretty explicit instructions in that page. But in most browsers, you can go into your history tab and click on the clear history or delete history option. It's important to do this. I would advise you do all of these things more or less weekly. If you're using a browser that provides a lot more security than the basics, and that includes a, one of the browsers from Mozilla that will clear everything every time you exit the browser. Um, turn that on too, okay? Clearing your cache again removes those temporary files. Deleting cookies are a good idea. Now remember, if you delete your cookies, your browser is, when it goes back to a website that you've been to before, no one's going to remember that you were there. So it's not going to be able to, uh, you know, jump you right back into the session you were in. So that's the downside of deleting all these older cookies. Also, many people are using their browsers to store their passwords. That's something else I really want to discourage because those passwords that are stored there in the browser are potentially pretty problematic. Because again, if that browser's hacked, if your computer's hacked, the passwords could be accessible to the bad guys. So your bank password that you've stored, you know, you said, yeah, yeah, remember that for me. That password is now available on your computer to bad guys that can gain access to it. Now, the, a lot of us use browser extensions. I certainly do. 
I have one password, for instance, for keeping all of my passwords and keeping that information straight. And one password has an extension that I have in my browser so it can do an autofill for me, okay? It's pretty darn good. So to disable them, you can go to the extension section of the browser, toggle off all of the extensions you are not actively using. I typically have them disabled. If I need one, I turn it on. That's the safest, safest way to do it. And then the other thing you should consider is the private browsing mode. Many people do use it just generally, and uh, you'll find it in pretty much every browser. Sometimes it's called private browsing. Sometimes it's called incognito mode. But it, what's happening at that point is it's not using your cookies. It's not storing cookies. It's not storing your browsing history. It's not creating those temporary files that last long term. So again, using private browsing mode really will help to mi minimize your browser footprint, something you should do. Now, third-party cookies have been a problem for a long time, but most browsers nowadays allow you to turn off what are called cross-site cookies. Maybe I should do a webinar on this and walk you guys through it. L let me know. Just email me, me at craigpeterson.com. Let me know if you think it's a good idea. If enough people ask, I'll, I'll go ahead and put one together, a free little webinar for everybody. But there are a lot of potential problems with these cookies, cross-site cookies, the session hijacking, tracking, profile building, privacy violations, and I've got step-by-step -step instructions in the article for Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Microsoft Edge. All right, visit me online. Make sure you sign up for my newsletter. Get all of this stuff for free right there. CraigPeterson.com slash subscribe. We're still covering have you had your data stolen, where it was stolen. I'm going to tell you right now a website that you can go to to find out if your personal information has been stolen. And it'll even monitor it for you for free. There's a guy by the name of Troy Hunt. He's down in Australia. And he started a website some years back. And the name's an interesting one. This has to do initially with gamers, online gamers, and then hackers kind of took it over. And it, it's the concept of being owned. You know, I, I own your computer now because I have complete control of it. And then that owned term kind of changed into pwned which is, you know, I stole it from you, basically. Uh, it's now mine. I don't care if it's in your house and you're paying the electric bill. It's mining Bitcoin for me, right? And so he put together a website called HaveIBeenPwned.com. Now, it's not P-O-W-N-E-D. It's P-W-N-E-D. Let me see. Have I been P-O-W-N-E-D? What happens if I go to the wrong URL? Okay, good. It sends you the right one. So it's have I been P-W-N-E-D dot com. Go there. I, if you haven't been there, you have to go there because he has a service that's another part of this whole concept here with having multiple firewalls. It, it's kind of like a submarine. If one one part of the submarine gets damaged, water comes in, you've got hatches in between these other sections and they are not going to get breached, right? You just want the water in one area of a ship or a submarine or the same thing with a firewall. So he has done some amazing yeoman's work. He wasn't paid for any of this for a, the longest time. Now he has a subscription service, and it's being used by 1Password, which is the, my favorite password manager by far. Nobody else even comes close. It's also being used by the browser guys like Google and others. So it's to be trusted. I've never met Troy Hunt myself. I've read a lot of stuff that he's written, and I've seen him speak and things. But uh, this is the website. So it's have, H-A-V-E-I-B-E-E-N, B -E -E -N, pwned, P-W-N-E-D dot com, or you can spell it P-O-W-N-E-D if you'd like. 
go there and you will see there on his home page a box that you can punch in your email or your phone number. Now it says international format. So let me make sure you understand what that is. International format, if you're entering a U.S. number, you would say plus one and then the phone number. Okay, our country code is one because, you know, we're the greatest, right? <laughs> well, we were first, the whole phone system in setting up all of the standards. So we are one. So you need to say plus one, your area code, and then your phone number, whatever it might be. And then he will go ahead and look it up in his massive database. So what they've been doing is uh, they have, they being Troy, has been working with companies who had data stolen. And because data had been stolen uh, and these companies wanted to actually kind of be good about it, right, they went ahead and told told uh, Tony here's here's all of the people's information that was stolen here's what was stolen because you need to know that now I got to tell you most businesses if they are hacked have no clue what was stolen or what the bad guys did and usually by the way the bad guys are living inside your network for a very very long time uh, so he has that but he also has information that has come from the dark web and this is one case where I think the government getting involved has been a good thing. The federal government, as they find information about stolen accounts and things online, they've been sending some of that off to Troy. So I think that's fantastic. All here, all trustworthy. So if you put in your phone number here, or if you put in your email address, or your password, and we'll talk about that in a second, don't worry about it. You're not giving it to the bad guys. And if you look up in what's called the URL bar up on the top or near the top of your browser where it has the address of the site that you're on, you'll see a little lock sign and it says the connection is secure. If you click on it, you can look at the certificate and you can see, okay, the certificate is from Cloudflare. They are a company that protects websites. So probably pretty darn legitimate. So I just put in one of my email addresses. This is a throwaway address I've been using for 20, 30 years. And it says, oh no, pwned. All right, so it's telling me that this email address that I've been using for almost 30 years, and it's my own private domain, actually, not almost 30 years, for 30 years, uh, actually 31 now, has been stolen in a data breach. So it's telling me here that it's been pwned in eight data breaches and found in one paste. And let's explain what those are. So the breaches are when bad guys have stolen data. It's been unintentionally exposed to the public. It's been uh, stolen because a bad guy got onto the network, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. It's very, very good. And I notice now that Troy Hunt here on haveibeenpwned.com has a link now to one password password manager which as i said is the only one i use and now it looks like troy, troy is recommending it hopefully he makes a couple of bucks off of that because man has he been doing yeoman's work so it's showing me uh, adobe so 153 million adobe accounts were breached with each containing an internal id username email encrypted password password hint in plain text and more and it says the password cryptology was poorly done. In other words, it was crap. Uh, B2B USA business, 105 million individuals in that breach. Uh, BitTorrent, January 2016, uh, was hacked. BitTorrent is a protocol that I use for downloading copies of large files, particularly Unix executables, ISO images and things, and share them with people. Uh, Clear Voice Surveys. This was in April 2021, and they had a publicly facing database backup that was taken and redistributed on a popular hacking forum. Isn't that something? 15 million unique email addresses, 17 million rows of data, included names, physical and IP addresses, sex, dates of birth, plain text passwords. Oh my gosh. Um, 
Data enrichment exposure. This was in October 2019. 1.2 billion records. Dropbox, mid 2012, mid and in August 2016, they uh, they had stolen in 2012. Looks like email addresses and passwords. Verifications.io, February 2019. Right. This just goes on and on. Zynga. So let me see that um, verifications with 763 million unique email addresses, dates of birth, employers, sex, geographic locations, job titles, names, phone numbers, physical addresses, and Zynga. So what I've been seeing, and, and by the way, in the paste, this is the undergroundrevolution.eu paste is what it was called, and it had 34,000 emails in it. So... What does all of this mean? Well, all of this means that I am going to see email that's very convincing. I'm already seeing it. I'm seeing emails, these spam phishing emails that are actually spear phishing in my email boxes that have in them my address, my name, sometimes my phone number, and they're trying to convince me of something, right? It's like, okay, um, your account has been compromised. That's just such a common thing for them to say, because it has been. Uh, and uh, here's, you know, we need you to do an update. Uh, it's account associated with, and then they give the physical street address or the P.O. box, whatever it might be, so they can steal your information. So that is HaveIBeenPwned.com. Check it out. Make sure you get my newsletter. It's free. The information's free. CraigPeterson.com slash subscribe. And we're going to get into 2FA, 2FA right now. We're going to talk about authenticators right now. Two-factor, multi-factor. What is this? You're hearing it all of the time. Some of us are being required to use it for our businesses and you're going to see it more and more for good reason. So probably the first industries to really start using the authenticator idea was banking. It's probably number one and it was to help secure online banking, financial transactions and, and then in more recent years we've seen other industries jumping in including healthcare government, technology companies like mine, all using them. Well, why do we use authenticators? You might have seen them. There, some of them are these little key fobs, right, that have a six-digit number that keeps rotating. Some of them are apps. That's what I tend to use on our phones. Uh, the list goes on and on of some of the things that they can do, should do, etc. But the reason you want to use an authenticator like that is because the most secure way of handling your authentication is something you know along with something you have. So the something you know would be your username or your email address and your password, right? That's something you know. But we now know that the bad guys know our usernames and passwords, right? Well, and that's part of the reason I keep saying use a different username or email address and definitely use a different password for every website out there, right? With, without a single exception. You have to do that. And the reason you have to do that is because they've got your current password. They've got your current email address. So what happens with an authenticator is, okay, you know your username and your password. The bad guy knows your username and password. But with an authenticator, they have to have that six-digit code that changes every 30 seconds. They don't have it, right? At least you hope they don't have it. And they don't have it because if you're using an authenticator like one of those little key fobs or you're using an application on your phone some of these applications are free such as google authenticator and google authenticator is a great little authenticator google authenticator works on all kinds of websites right now. Google, of course, uses it. Dropbox, Facebook, Microsoft, most banks, they all use it. 
So it's free. Why aren't you using it? So what you have to do is you download it onto your smart device. It can be Android. It can be iPhone. And you download Google Authenticator absolutely free. And then what you do is you go to a website that supports Google Authenticator or compatible, right? There's lots of compatible password managers, such as 1Password, which is the one I recommend, and many others that I won't mention because I don't recommend them, okay? Um, but they're all compatible with Google Authenticator. So you go to the website, usually you'll go into your account settings. And in your account settings where you would change your password, you set up, it's usually called 2FA for 2 factor authentication. What's the first factor? Your username and password. What's your second factor? It is the authenticator. So you set up the authenticator. It might show you a QR code that you scan with your phone. Very easy to do. Uh, I also, if you're using 1Password on your laptop or desktop computer, it shows that, uh, that website will show you that uh, QR code and 1Password will automatically find it on the page and set you all up. It is so easy to do nowadays. So you now have in your Google Authenticator or 1Password, you now have an account for that specific website, no matter what it is, the bank, Microsoft, Google, whatever. Okay. And so now next time you want to go log in, What's it going to do? Well, be, by the way, it's before you even get to the point of login in again. Once you set it up, it's going to say, okay, so tell me what the current six-digit code is just to make sure everything worked right. If you don't give it the right six-digit code, then, well, that failed and you have to try it again, right? Try to set it up again. It's not going to penalize you because you didn't have the right code, right? You don't lose access to your account. So there's not a lot to worry about here. So next time you go to log in, you are going to be able to pull up Google Authenticator and log in to that account. Now, uh, Google Authenticator, as long as your phone's getting backed up, you're not going to lose those authentications. But there's another trick I want you guys to be aware of. And that is when you set up an authenticator, it will often give you the option of having a bunch of codes, one-time use codes generated. So it'll generate eight or a dozen, maybe more, of these one-time codes. And the idea behind this is keep those codes, don't lose those codes. And if for some reason you're, you lose your authenticator, the phone gets destroyed, your backup didn't work, you can still log in by using one of those one-time passwords. Now, there's a big difference between using an authenticator application that has that six digit code that keeps rotating every 30 seconds with a, a new code. Big difference between that and getting a text message. Text messages can can be and are intercepted. And at the very beginning, I was talking about what? I was talking about getting a text message saying uh, your account has been breached we need to confirm that this is you so that we can clean up the mess and, and uh, please respond with the six digit code that we send you and then the bad guy goes and logs into microsoft google dropbox box facebook your bank whatever it is and what is that company going to do it's going to send you a six digit code because now you're safe right and so that six-digit code comes to your phone. And remember, you just got this other text message that said, uh, we're, we're trying to verify the you. You need to send us this code to make sure it's you. And so people now send that six-digit code off, and the bad guys now have your one-time password, your two-factor authentication, that six-digit number that was texted to you, right? So be very, very careful. It could be done with a something like Google Authenticator or 1Password, too. They could say, oh, we're going to, well, we need to know your six digit code. But it's a little more obvious that they're trying to get your uh, two factor six digit code from you when it's a, an Authenticator app versus it's just a text message. Then the other thing that's happened before with the text message thing is, uh, well, a couple of different things. One, 
And, and this is very, very targeted, right? They've got to be coming after you. They know you own a business that has a lot of cash in a bank account that they can steal, or very frequently, you've got a lot of Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency that they want to get their hands on. So what they'll do is they will either transfer your phone number to their phone, or they will try and clone your SIM. And they do that by calling up your cell phone carrier and pretending they are you. So I want to ask you a question. I want you to think about this seriously. How much information about you is up on the internet? What do you post on Facebook? What do you post on LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever it is you use online? Can the bad guys go there and figure out enough about you to fool the phone company into transferring your phone number to them? Man, this happens. I know this one guy had a lot of, it was actually Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and he noticed that his phone just I hadn't met, you know, I'm getting this normal volume of messages or or phone calls. So he started looking into it and that's exactly what had happened to him. So call your phone carrier right now and say, hey, uh, Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, whoever it is you're using, um, I want to make sure we set up a password so that only I can call and make changes to my account. That makes sense to you? Makes, makes a lot of sense to me. So do that. Do that as soon as the show is over. <laughs> okay? Because um, I got some more information for you here. So the, that's one of the things they do. And they cannot do that. It, it doesn't matter. It's still my phone number all day long. You're not going to have my unique six digit number that changes every 30 seconds that little key is not going to be in your hands now you should do this and i have myself done this on every website that supports it i did it with my buddy and it was really kind of fun with him going through because he had a lot of resistance to doing it and this is even after he had had two paychecks stolen by the bad guys because of how he did things, right? With his passwords and his accounts and everything else, right? Uh, sometimes. But anyways, uh, it, it's not that hard to do. Now, my business, as you probably know by now, is cybersecurity. It's been my focus in the online world really since I got hacked on the internet back in uh, 91, I guess it was, 92. Uh, back then, it wasn't terribly malicious. It was called the Morris Worm, and uh, it it really hurt my business there for a few days while I tried to figure out what was going on. But uh, I've been doing this for over 30 years, and I have a free newsletter, absolutely free. It is not chock full of advertisements. It's chock full of great information, including my weekly featured tip. And it's something that you should get and you should have. But because my business is cybersecurity, I don't just use two-factor authentication. I use multi-factor authentication. So I, for things that we log in at, when we have customer information, it's a username, it's a password, and with us, it's also some the one password token kind of like what we were just been talking about here with using a google authenticator compa authenticator compatible uh device but um i also require biometrics so it also has to do with face scan for, in order for us to get at any of our customers information so read this article if you didn't get it if you're not on my list yet just email me at craigpeterson.com. Let me know what you want. Be glad to send it off or Mary will send it. Take care. Craigpeterson.com online. We had some questions about my featured tip that's in the newsletter. 
This one was called Staying Ahead of the Curve, Uncovering the Most Dangerous Cyber Threats to Small Business. And, and I give some step-by-step -step instructions. So we're going to go through this because it applies to businesses as well as home users. There are so many threats out there. And so what we've been doing, when I say we, I mean my wife and I, is putting together these featured tips in our free newsletter that goes out every week. And it is rather extensive. We're trying to do a very good job on this. She's already got 50 of them written. So there's at least a year's worth of these coming out in the newsletters. And they're designed to try and keep it simple, giving you step-by-step -step instructions and, and making it so that it's only going to take you five or ten minutes to lock something down so rather than going to one of my bigger courses or whatever if you want to try and keep your small business computers or your home machines safe all you have to do is read this every week and just you know make a little change here and there we're trying to make it very simple but we also have to remember that when it comes to cybersecurity, it's not a one and done situation. Cybersecurity is something you have to stay on top of. So I don't want you to think either that this means, ta-da, you're all set, right? You, you've got to keep up with stuff. And that's the reason you read the newsletter, I think, in most cases. This week, I got a note from one of the listeners, and I'm just trying to find what his name is. I think it was a guy. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, here we go. And he is talking, his name's Larry, and he's talking about Grammarly. Now, Grammarly is something that I've mentioned on the air before as a completely indispensable tool, tool if you are writing, if you're a business person, if you're a student, if you want to make sure that your spelling's correct, your grammar's correct, punctuation, right? All of that sort of stuff. That's what Grammarly does. And it is absolutely fantastic for doing that. But he reminded me of something that I, I probably forgot to mention to you guys, right? And that is there are security concerns. Because remember, when you're using something like Grammarly, it goes and uploads what you're typing into the cloud, right? So in other words, up into some data center somewhere that they are most likely renting space at, right? I, I doubt most companies nowadays like Grammarly would bother owning the infrastructure because it lets them, you know, the cloud upscale, downscale is perfect for them, perfect for startups, although the cost can be kind of high. So you want to stay ahead of the curve, uncover really your, your mistakes in writing. And nowadays, everybody's talking about these AIs out there, chat GPT being the one most people talk about. Uh, I use a couple of others. I'm trying to get uh, this company on, and it, it's hard to reach people nowadays. There's so much spam, and, and they just don't know, should I read this email? Should I read this email? Uh, and then on top of it, they are all worried that, oh, no, the media, the media, we're going to get ripped to shreds. No, come on. I don't do that. I've done over 8,000 interviews now with C-level people and aired them. And I have never, ever backed anybody into a corner. So I'm not going to do that. But I, I want to get these guys on because they have a tool that is absolutely amazing. And it's designed for writing stuff. And I've been using it for some of the blog posts we put up. And people have been commenting on how much they like them. And these blog posts are, again, this type of thing that we're going to talk about now, which is staying ahead of the curve and what are the biggest cyber threats to people out there. And it is great because it what it does is it helps you to structure it. So it comes up with the structure. You can change the general structure, the the titles, right? The subtitles, all of that stuff. It just generates them, which is wonderful. So I go in. I'd say most of the time I get rid of well, maybe a third of those little titles that comes up with suggestions. And I add in probably a half a dozen more. And then we work together and flesh it out and everything. It's just a fantastic tool. 
And it, it is an AI. But again, remember, AIs cannot be trusted, but they are great when you're writing. And you got that old good old writer's block, and that's exactly what this particular AI is aiming at, is people that have to do writing. Not necessarily for a living, but have to write stuff. So if you're an HR department, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. But remember it gets uploaded to the cloud. So if you're writing a document in Grammarly, and let's say there's some confidential information in there, there's some PII, personal inf identifiable information, you don't want to use one of these tools that pushes it up to the cloud. And one of the main reasons is it's against the law in most cases. But the other reason is, well, what happens when they get hacked? That cloud server gets hacked, that company gets hacked, and your information is now part of a bin paste, paste bin, right? It's uh, out there, bad guys have it, and could be used against you. So you got to keep that in mind. And, and again, I want to thank Larry for pointing that out. It's a very good point. And I did try Grammarly on my phone, and Grammarly has a keyboard. So as you're typing, it's sending what you're typing up to the cloud, and it is helping you to fix grammatical problems with it. And and I've, I expect here shortly it'll even help you write whatever you're typing. So that, you know that means text messages, that means whatever document you might be working on, whatever website you might be on, and it's going up to the cloud instantly. Now, one of the nice things about the Grammarly keyboard and using it on iOS, on iOS, if you are down in the typing area, you can select your keyboard. So in mine, I've got two keyboards. I've got an English keyboard and a French Canadian keyboard that I use. And obviously those are designed for different languages and what, uh, what you might want to type in. It's kind of handy, by the way, if you're multilingual, because it will even let you type in another language than your keyboard is set to. So you can be typing in in uh, English and throw in a French phrase, and it will go ahead and do it all of French stuff for you. But uh, be very concerned about stuff like this, right? Pay attention. It's so easy to use, and it is so helpful we kind of many times overlook some of the security threats that are involved. If you're using Google Docs, I put together my Insider Show Notes newsletter, you know, the one that has that featured tip every week. I put it together along with my team in Google Docs. Now, I'm not worried if somebody steals it because we're going to post this on the website. It's going to go out in the email, uh, insider show notes, or, you know, it's going to go out there somewhere. So I'm just not worried about it. But, um, you know, be careful because if you're used to using it for stuff that doesn't really matter, it's not regulated, it's not personally identifiable, doesn't have your bank account in it, it just gets so easy to kind of forget about that. And then you're in real trouble because you're now using it for things that you should never have used it for. And if you were thinking about it, would never use it for. So a little word of advice and thanks, Larry, for the reminder again about that, about that particular problem. So let's get into this here. We're going to cover right now, we only got a couple of minutes left in this segment. But um, here's a high level, okay? There's a lot of different cyber threats out there. They are changing every week, every patch. Tuesday, Microsoft releases new patches, including what are called zero days. And a zero day means, hey, uh, you have no defense against this particular type of attack unless you install this patch. Uh, that's what zero day means in the Microsoft Patch Tuesday world, okay? Uh, there are many of them out there. And, and that's part of what we're going to be doing here is helping you guys know about which particular patches matter to you, which ones are being actively exploited, which ones are expected to be exploited within the next 30 days. Isn't that exciting? So I'm going to be doing that sometime soon. Man, I've been working on that code for about six months and um, I'm almost there, almost done. 
So that's going to be a good thing for everybody. So let me just give you the top six points, and then we're going to dive, dive into them a little bit because we had questions, as I mentioned, about some of the details. So ransomware attack, that's kind of a big deal. If you're a business, if you're an individual, it is as well. But hopefully you're doing backups. But we, we'll talk about this, okay? Um, because there's types of backups you should be doing and other types that just aren't going to work. Phishing scams that are out there, what are called advanced persistent threats. Those are very, very big deal. Uh, insider threats, man, those have been around forever, haven't they? Uh, let's see, distributed denial of service attacks and the information of things botnets. Now, this is really kind of interesting, too, because, man, botnets have also been around for a while now in the computer internet world. But did you know your light bulb could be used to bring down the Kremlin or the Pentagon or an airplane? Yeah, so that light bulb can. And we're going to talk about that. We'll get into this in some more detail. If you want to follow along, it was in this free newsletter this week. My insider show notes, hopefully you got that. And if you don't, sign up at craigpeterson.com slash subscribe. And you'll get one of these from me every week. And it will help you to know what to do, when to do it. We've also got a really interesting article I wrote about the new hunter killer satellites that are preparing for space war. And we're talking about some private industry that's doing this as well. It isn't just government. We're running through some of the top threats right now when it comes to your data. Particularly interesting here is the threat to small business, but every one of these applies to home users. You, you could lose everything. You know, by now you know me, I'm not going to leave you high and dry, right? This isn't just trying to get people to freak out and then take some action that I'm not even going to tell them about. I have all of this. We're talking about all of this, all of the things you should do. And more specifically, I have it in my newsletter and on my website. And I'll be glad to send you this article. It goes into a lot of detail here. You should print it up and stick it in your drawer so that you have it if you need it, right? This is one of those playbook type things that could be very, very important for you. All of these threats, what you should do, how can you detect it, and what do you do after the fact if you've been hacked. Phishing scams, man, these things are constant. And phishing scams can be really hard to spot. I was just talking about them on the radio and uh, this week, and th the host that I was talking to was saying he, he got a very interesting little text message from his bank saying, hey, listen. Oh, no, it wasn't the bank. It was his, his uh, cell phone provider. Hey, listen, uh, you are a good customer, so click here, and we'll give you 10% off. So he was looking at it and decided, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some investigation here. I'm smart. I have Craig Peterson on as my guest. And he started doing some searching online. And he found online that, yeah, okay, there's, uh, yeah, 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 there's my provider, cell phone provider. Yeah, they do have customer loyalty discounts. Yeah, and, and it's 10%. But he's still sitting there saying, what should I do? Is this a real phishing scam? You know, the goal of these scams is to get you to give up sensitive information. Things like your usernames, your passwords, credit card details. So he might do all of that research and say, okay, this is legit. But if I want to get this 10%, I got to click on this link that was text to me. You can click on that link. It'll take you to a site that looks just like your bank, or in his case, your cell phone provider, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Okay, so it wants me to log in. I'll write my username, uh, my password. Okay, here we go. 
and then your page refreshes and it asks again for you to enter your username and password and you're sitting there thinking, oh okay well whatever i must have messed something up here's my username and here's my password okay but it, it doesn't say anything about 10 percent, so i'm going to dig around a little bit let me tell you what just happened that first time when he clicked the link and he went to the website supposedly of his cell phone provider someone had cloned that home page slash login page from his cell phone provider and put it up on another website. So that's where it comes in handy to use that little lock. You might have noticed that up in the left-hand side of that URL bar, and it's telling you about the connection itself, and it'll tell you what certificate, who issued it, who owns this, right? All of that sort of stuff. So on my website, it says it's craigpeterson.com and it's organizations Cloudflare because I'm using Cloudflare to protect craigpeterson.com and also, frankly, to speed it up, right? All right. So that might be legitimate. It might not be legitimate. When it comes to banks, when it comes to bigger ones, uh, you don't have to worry about that as much of the fact that it's Cloudflare. So I'm going right now. I'm going to tmobile.com. That's who I've been using now for a little while. It's saying, okay, the I clicked that little lock to the left of tmobile.com. It says uh, connection is secure. And I click on the certificate and it says certificates valid. And it says the name is tmobile.com. Organization tmobileusa.com. So by using that little thing at the side, you can tell whether or not you are talking to a domain that is truly registered by who you think it is. So I'm going to Verizon right now, verizon.com. That It's got that nice little lock and it says connection is secure. So I click on that. Now it's telling me there's 82 cookies in use. Man, they like cookies, don't they? Uh, so it says the connection is secure, certificate's valid. So I'm going to click on that. And it says, yeah, its organization is Verizon Digital Media Services, Inc. All right, so that's probably their website. Now, what I don't want you to do is to do what I've seen done sometimes as much as a third of the time when people are coming to craigpeterson.com. You can type craigpeterson.com into the URL bar. That's the bar pretty much right at the top of the web browser. Now, if you're obviously using a mobile device, nowadays they're at the bottom if you're using a, an Apple iOS device, right? But you know where that URL bar is. It tells you who it is that you are talking to, what the page is. It tells you all that wonderful stuff. Good. Okay. Here's the problem. A lot of people, by default, when they open their browser, it's got a search box from Bing or a search box from Google or maybe DuckDuckGo. Could be a lot of different places, right? Got that nice little search box. So people will go ahead and type into that search box, craigpeterson.com. That's not where you're supposed to type it. So if you type in craigpeterson.com there, right at the top, it shows Craig Peterson. Reliable cybersecurity for a small business, it says, right? Make your cybersecurity compliance frustrations disappear quickly. NIST 800-171, CMMC, DFARS, blah, 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 right? All of this stuff. All right. And it's showing the URL is HTTPS colon slash slash craigpeterson.com. You like it? Okay. So far, so good. The problem is there are ways to poison the search engines. And it's been done many times. And this happened to my father. My dad had a problem with Windows. So what does he do? He goes online and he does a search for Microsoft tech support. And he ends up with a scammer. Yeah, pretty bad, eh? Yeah, the security guy, <laughs> his dad. However, my stepmother was kind of looking over her shoulder and gave me a call on the side and said, here's what's happening with your dad right now. So we hopped on his computer remotely and poked around and took care of some things for him. And it was pretty scary. 
So here's what can happen. It's one thing to search for Microsoft tech support. It's another thing to search for uh, your bank name.com, your uh, cell phone provider.com or craigpeterson.com because those search results might not be what you're looking for. Okay, you got it? They might not be the right place. So if you don't type that URL for your cell phone provider into the URL bar, you could very well be going to a bad guy's website because of the search engine. So keep that in mind, right? That's what the phishing guys are trying to get you to do. So step one, he clicked on that link in his text message. It took him to a website. That website asked him to log in. Looked like it was his cell phone company. And then his page refreshed and he logged in again. So that first time around, he was actually giving his username and his password to the bad guys on their website that looks exactly like the cell phone site. And the page refreshed. Why? Well, because the bad guys have his username and password and they sent him to the real site. So he logged in there again. So be very, very careful with these phishing emails because they are nasty. Next up, advanced persistent threats. Join me online, craigpeterson.com. This one is probably the scariest of all of these tips that we're going to cover today, and that's called advanced persistent threat APTs. Unless you are a pro, pro when it comes to cybersecurity, you might not have heard of these, but this is important. Well, so far we've talked about ransomware, including what to do if you've been hit with ransomware, but what are the attacks? How could it affect you? We talked about phishing scams, and uh, we didn't have time to go through the concerns you should have, but uh, in some ways they're pretty obvious. And I'd be glad to send you a link to this article. Uh, believe me, I, I'm not going to harass you or anything else. Just email me, me at craigpeterson.com and ask for it and, and I'll send it to you. If you don't say anything in the email, uh, other than send it to e me at craigpeterson.com, you may not get a response because I don't know what you want. You're not talking to an automated system. You're talking to Mary or maybe Karen or I, uh, you're not talking to an automated system. It's just going to start blurring you with all kinds of stuff. So make sure you reach out. Just email me at craigpeterson.com. Be glad to get back with you. Also, there are a couple of other things we may not get to today besides advanced persistent threats, but the insider threats, distributed denial of service attacks, IoT botnets, all of that is explained in this article that, that uh, I'll be more than glad to send to you. Just email me at craigpeterson.com. Now, it, let's get into this here. The advanced persistent threats. I, I don't think most people have heard of these, but you'll understand the concept. This is a type of cyber attack where it, it's a group, really, of skilled and, and well-funded attackers. Many times they are what we call state actors. In other words, it might be North Koreans, it might be Russians, it might be, you know, one of those guys. But they use some pretty sophisticated techniques in order to get unauthorized access to your computer network or your computers. And the idea is once they gain access... They're going to keep up a long-term presence on your network without being detected. That's their goal. Right now, sometimes you can detect them. If they're really good, they're going to be really hard to detect. And the attacks themselves can often last for months or even years. That makes them way more dangerous than other forms of malware. And this is actually a very common type of attack. They'll get onto your network, they will poke around, they will find stuff, they will upload it, they might sell it to somebody, maybe even a competitor of yours, and then they might do something even worse. 
And I have seen cases where somebody got into a network of a business, and this is true for government agencies. I think there was even a DOD, Department of Defense one recently, and they'll steal some stuff, and then, you know, they don't want to really hurt you too bad right off the bat. It's like a fox. You know I have chickens. I have chickens, and I have bees, and we have cats, and we have a dog, right? All of that sort of stuff. But when, when it comes to the chickens, I let them free range. So they go out in the pasture and, you know, they eat bugs and weed seeds and stuff. And they just have an all-around good time. They love doing that sort of thing. But we also have foxes in the area. Foxes are interesting hunters. They won't just come and kill every chicken. They will maybe kill two or three. And they will take them back to the den usually one at a time so they'll come back and pick it up but they won't come back to my chicken yard if you will for a while they actually move around so they try not to over harvest an area so they took some of my chickens and then they're going to go and steal and eat somebody's cat and Maybe they'll find some wild rabbits, and of course they eat mice, field mice, voles, moles, all that sort of thing, right? And they'll just keep moving and moving and moving. So they might not come back to my chickens for a few months. Well, that's very similar to how these advanced persistent threats work. These attacks will often last for months or even years, And the bad guys will get onto your system. They'll find some stuff that they can either sell or use and then kind of leave you alone. You know, they'll take it, obviously, and do their thing with it. But they're not about to ransom, encrypt all of your data. Make sense? So governments and these criminal groups are the ones that are usually using the advanced persistent threats. Excuse me. So here are some reasons you should be very concerned about these. Number one, obviously, is the persistence, right? It's right there in the name. They're designed to remain undetected for a long time. So the bad guys can get at sensitive data. They can get at the person identifiable information, trade secrets, intellectual property, customer data, right? They're targeted very highly targeted unlike phishing attacks and of course their payload could be ransomware which are sent out just to anybody's email address they can find usually phishing can be a little different i have seen phishing attacks that are pretty well planned so you got to be careful of some of those things that are out there okay but these things are sophisticated they they use social engineering they'll pretend they are tech support etc i was really impressed with one of my clients this is a new client uh and they're so happy to have us but we we went out to one of their facilities to remove all of this old software that this other managed services provider was using all of the solar winds and this other um not so great software we'll just leave it at that and the employees there had us wait until they could confirm we are who we say we are that was impressive okay because that is what's called a social engineering attack it's one of the types where you pretend or the bad guys pretend they're the it people and as the it people they want access to the computers now they have access to the computers they go ahead and put their software on now they're not likely to show up at your door unless they're really after you Uh, governments might show up at your door uh, pretending they are someone who they're not but expect a phone call okay it it happens all of the time they'll also use some of these zero day exploits that we hear about every month from microsoft i i love how there's microsoft patch tuesday they they put that in place because there were so many patches every day they were getting the black eyes so yeah 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 yeah. don't worry about it people uh yeah we might leave you exposed for 30 days maybe 60 or 90 days but don't worry about it microsoft drives me crazy um obviously there's a risk of financial loss very very big deal 
You, you could lose your financial information. We had that happen to a client as well, where there twice now, I think, two different clients, where all of the money was stolen out of their operating account. Obviously, reputation can be damaged. You could get regulatory fines. And one thing about an advanced persistent threat that isn't the case with so many other things is it can take a lot of resources in order to recover from it. Resource intensive recovery is what I've got here in this article. I'll be glad to send you this, by the way, all seven points on this as well as everything else. Just email me at craigpeterson.com. I'm glad to get it out to you. Um, so you're going to have to conduct a very thorough investigation, figure out what happened, how they got in, close those holes. Then you have to do some more remediation here. You're going to obviously have to improve your cybersecurity measures, and you're going to have to reinstall all of your computers that might have potentially been touched by these bad guys. And I don't mean, oh, I'm going to restore from backup, because you're probably going to restore the advanced persistent threat software, right, that you're trying to get rid of. I mean you are installing from scratch, you're erasing the machine. Nowadays, there's even an, another problem, which is the machine itself may have had its boot files modified. Think of it as the BIOS from the old days. So every time your computer boots up, even if you reinstalled Windows, it's going to reinstall their malware. Uh, insider threats, I'm going to go pretty fast here now because we're almost out of time for, again, for this segment. But insider threats are the most common type of cyber attack, believe it or not. So what is an insider? It's anybody working for you, could be a contractor, anybody that has access to your systems and data. So remember that. And their motivation could be money, could be revenge, could be ideology, right? They just uh, hate the fact that you like something or vice versa. And it also could just be a desire to steal data, disrupt operations. And think about all of the times that it's hit the news, particularly in the automotive sector where people have left one company, you know, Google, Apple, Uber, those types of companies, and they brought with them a treasure trove, not just of knowledge, but of data from the company. So they're stealing plans, they're stealing all of this stuff. Very, very bad. So keep in mind, disgruntled employees could steal property. They can steal proprietary information. They could sell it on the black market. They could sell it to their new boss. The Chinese pay dearly for some of this information. Could be employees that are exposing some of your sensitive data information, intellectual property, because of poor password management. They might use the same password everywhere online and the same email address or username. Could be an employee who's deliberately tamping, tampering with your systems to damage them. And we've seen that again and again. That's why you've got to make sure you are using a system that will, in fact, allow you to completely disconnect them. Think of what happened here recently with some of these layoffs and firings in these big tech companies like Twitter and all. What happened? They were fired, and the way they found out is their email didn't work anymore. You have to be one single switch that cuts off all access. So there's more. It's right there in this article. Distributed denial of service, IoT botnets, different types of cyber attacks, point after point after point. And it's all available for you. Just email me, me at craigpeterson.com, or maybe you got it in my insider show notes already. Check there. But... Man, this stuff's important.